Hello, everybody. Thanks so much uh, to the organizers for the invitation. Um, my name is Daniel Stark. I did team at both uh, McGill, uh, Faculty of Medicine and Science Departments, as well as in the Quebec DI Institute. And that already explains uh, what we're generally doing, which is to take large data sets with interesting, innovative data science technologies to revisit classic parts of citizen science. And today, the topic is going to be uh, mostly focused on large language models, because historically, we have seen a lot of increase of interest in the AI ecosystem since convolutional deep learning, roughly since 2010, 2012, what we're currently witnessing, I think it's good to say that we can view this as yet another wave of momentum in the AI ecosystems, thanks to large language models. So what started out to be as predicting the next word on the internet turned into um, phenomena of reasoning and of emergence, which uh, even the developers of these kinds of systems didn't necessarily expect. So this is just a picture of our team, which is uh, composed of technical people, computer scientists, engineers, and physicists, where we're trying to work closer with the main experts, as you'll see, to uh, address exciting questions. And so for the particular context of biomedicine now, um, which is particularly, ch particularly challenging, what types of requirements do we actually have for our machine learning platforms, for our data science platforms. Um, and um, the key surprise to many sometimes is that it's not just the excellence performance um, in classification tasks, in continuous outcome prediction tasks, as this is uh, typically the case in, in a lot of areas where machine learning and deep learning are applied. And a huge, huge emphasis is actually on being able to say why a certain model is working and how it exactly gets to a particular um, decision point. So we want to introspect um, our models. Sometimes people say in a, a post-mortem biopsy kind of way, we want to unbox the black box. And it's not just this, uh, what large language models are also very uh, useful for is anything that's related to integrating information from multiple different sources. This could be another point to consider. So um, large language models are probably going to be useful for a lot of different areas in biomedicine. And that is because we have text data in all sorts of parts of our health um, provider systems in health research. Um, one instantiation is probably electronic health records. So there is all sorts of ways in which we could apply large language models in hospitals and hospital-derived kind of data. And um, the big difference now is um, the limit of scale that has massively decreased. So uh, why have we been doing so much better in terms of scale uh, since very recently? And um, I would argue that it's the particular kind in which large language models are actually trained, which is the semi-supervised way. So classically, we really needed careful, often um, very laborious and slow annotation of all the various um, data points that we bring to bear in our training data. Um, but that has really changed with uh, Transformers since 2017 and the large language models because now we can really train um, one of those systems on the almost the entirety of the internet based on normative assumptions that's around 2 trillion tokens. And we do not need to provide any supervisory guidance to these learning systems. Um, they simply learn intrinsic structure in a way that we do not fully understand, which then leads to all kinds of emerging properties. So. And the quick definition, the working definition that I'm going to go here by uh, for transfer learning is going to be um, we try to extract intrinsic structure from a larger amount of data to then transition, carry over 
a particular learning solution to another area, typically more poor in data, to derive um, advantages. So you will see this can take all sorts of forms, um, but uh, it takes special relevance in neuroscience and medicine because despite the big data movement, I think it's fair to say that a lot of areas in neuroscience, a lot of areas in biomedicine, we do not have the amount of data that we would like, or I would personally argue, we do not have the amount of data that we would actually need to answer the kinds of questions that we have in a satisfying way. So, and um, the big question is now, how can we use general purpose data that's out there that has maybe nothing to do with a particular task in neuroscience or biomedicine to carry over this intrinsic structure, this average internet mind, this extracted semantic world knowledge that the large language model has uh, extracted to a downstream task for our advantage. <clears throat> we have seen an emergence of a large series of scaling studies how these transfer learning uh, phenomena actually occur. Um, the basic economics of model training has for a long time been that um, the larger you make the models, the better the work. Or more specifically, here I see a, uh, we see a small plot from the Kaplan 2020, 2020 paper. And this really investigated three main parameters, um, the model size in terms of parameters, the data size, as well as the amount of compute budget that we have. What they found is um, you do avoid overfitting. You do keep learning interesting, coherent structure as you increase the data and the number of parameters to the model size at the same time. So, and uh, surprisingly, despite their monstrosity, large language models really turn out to be highly data efficient. So um, we can typically comfortably train on two to 20 times uh, more tokens than we have parameters in a model. So um, that is what I call um, data efficient here at this point. So of course there are there are recent other developments. We uh, learned at uh, just Europe last year that maybe this is a function of metrics, perhaps we had uh, emergent phenomena already before the current era of large language models, uh, or maybe there aren't even real emergence phenomena or uh, reasoning and understanding the, of these systems, if you will. Um, and paradoxically, we observe that now large language models keep getting always smaller again. So, um, the recent realization really seems to be that um, we do not necessarily need always larger, always higher parameter values. If we have always more higher quality data, perhaps that's actually enough to really learn high quality large language model systems. So um, let's motivate why it's actually so difficult once we have a working large language model system to make sense of why it's exactly working. So, Probably a lot of you have seen uh, these kinds of representations, symbolic schematics. Um, and we have essentially three steps. Um, the first one being the input embedding. So different from other machine learning systems, we really need tokens, we really need bag of words kind of input representations, which don't need to be text. It actually works with sequences in general, which makes uh, large language models, of course, interesting for all kind of biological sequences, such as um, uh, DNA sequences, protein sequences, or um, tra transcripts in cells, for example. So the first stage is we derive an embedding so a uh, real value vector for um, text sequences in our input data. So that is still uh, fairly straightforward, but really starts to get much more complicated the moment we get to um, the attention part of uh, a transformer layer. Um, so this can be presented in all sorts of ways. I just want to point your attention to the fact that 
the transformer is really uh, a series of linear operations. So it's not necessarily um, the part that is most difficult to introspect. So and that makes it a natural starting point for any agenda of uh, making sense of how large language models quote unquote reason. So as the first approximation, you can think that uh, what is the A matrix here, the confluence of uh, the Q and K um, systems, the queries and the keys, is that uh, this very much pertains to uh, how information flows from a source token to a target token. Um, and it is the the O and the B matrices instead that are really about uh, controlling which kinds of information are actually transferred between this source and target tokens. Um, so that is just uh, one way of simplifying uh, a little bit how we think about the attention layer of a transformer block. And I said yet uh, a little bit different, you can think of it as a QK circuit as some call it here, um, and that is because uh, the K and the Q matrices um, almost act together and uh, in the same vein, um, the output value for the uh, circuit in turn also acts in concert. So why don't we think of them as joint operations to hopefully make progress towards a uh, mechanistic interpretability? So yet another time, all of these, as you can see here from the linear order of perspective, are linear operations. However, even just these attention circuits, it has been quite difficult to make progress uh, understanding them. Um, so I already mentioned uh, most, of, most of these points. Um, and that is despite the fact that the last part of the transformer book, the NLP, the multi-layer perception part of it, the fully connected forward neural network. It's even more penetrable. This part usually makes up roughly two thirds of the overall uh, parameters of um, a large language model. Um, and we know from the deep learning uh, literature before large language models that it is uh, quite difficult to really uh, decipher, disentangle the, the, the meaning, the concepts the unique aspects that uh, are encoded, transported, represented through these nonlinear layers. So uh, overall, we have several of those in a block, a series of those typically, and that makes it even more challenging because the embeddings that we learn in the first transformer layer, they may actually, uh, they trickle down with their attention emphasis to the next layer and, and so on and so forth. So this stands in contrast to how mm, we tried to operate with the last generation natural language processing systems. So I'm thinking of uh, a lot of word to back which emerged after 2010. There, we had a big emphasis on so-called semantic embedding, so semantic embedding factors. So, uh, uh, notion, the meaning of a word typically, as you see here on the, on the bottom of the slide, the form that it took typically is that you represent them not as a string, but as a real valued vector in a high dimensional semantic coordinate system, where the position in this multi-dimensional coordinate system denotes the, the meaning. And that then in turn means that we can actually do a semantic vector operations once we have continuous vector spaces, uh, which already hints at the universality of spanning semantic spaces in general, um, we can actually go and compute what uh, semantic embedding vectors are how similar to each other or how distant from each other. And this allows us to um, do all sorts of interesting downstream operations. However, this way of thinking um, is less prominent in the large language model literature at this point from my reading of the literature. So as you can see, there's four sorts of operations we uh, can reframe, reconsider parts of the system in all sorts of ways. 
Um, and I hope I've provided a few examples of what form this can take. So back to the NLP layer, where we have the actual nonlinear processing operations. Um, part of the reason why this is so challenging is uh, what's called fully semanticity. So um, we do not necessarily have clean neuron interpretations. A single neuron in the MLP does not necessarily correspond to a single concept or a single notion as we would like that are directly accessible to us humans. Um, that's apparently not been the case. Um, and so we end up with um, a, a compressed representation of what is potentially a way of encoding more concepts or high level features as some people call it, then you have uh, hidden dimensions in the MLP part. So um, it may be possible to reverse this compression. And there are ways to do this, um, for example, based on sparse or complete dictionary learning, where you try to unpack hundreds and hundreds, and actually thousands of underlying uh, features or concepts that MLP layers are representing, um, which you would not guess was just looking at the activations of uh, the hidden neural network layer. Yet another way of thinking about it is um, perhaps there are um, so-called privileged bases into which we can rotate the hidden layer activations such that the axis of our new coordinate system in which we into which we walk our NLP activations may much more naturally align with concepts of notions that are accessible to us humans. So one strategy to make progress in large language models, with, which have been tried uh, and showed some initial uh, progress, would be re-expressing the high-dimensional activations in the MLP into another space. Uh, but the question is, how do you actually how do you actually find these other spaces? However, if we can do this, uh, we could overcome uh, the curse of dimensionality. Um, which is also a problem because um, for the investigator, um, it is typically a challenge to just even visualize the intermediate processing or modeling products that emerge as we look at information, how it flows through the system. So it's not just that, it's also quantitatively measuring inter interpretability has been difficult to automatize. So that means it is difficult, it requires human intervention and it's slow. And so it would be great if we could come up with metrics that allow us to just approximate the degree to which we can uh, generate human interpretable representations for what is going on in the NLP layers of uh, LLMs. So this takes me to why we are exactly um, using LLMs in our particular project that I want to talk to you today, and that is autism. So second part of the talk, autism um, is a part of uh, psychiatry. Um, and as a lot of people know this very quick, it's a very special discipline inside of medicine because um, we do not really necessarily have hard currency markers to detect uh, whether a certain child, a certain individual with a suspicion of autism actually does carry this diagnosis or not. We cannot draw blood uh, and we don't have any other established trusted biomarkers that we could use to really be sure. So what happens is, you really need uh, people trained after medical school for years and years and years to specialize in finding out, in encountering, when they encounter somebody, okay, does that individual in front of me meet the criteria for the diagnosis of autism or not? And just the definition of autism to make things worse has been a, a moving target. So um, autism as a concept probably emerged 
around 1900. And it initially described um, a particularly strong disinterest in reality. So it started to be described as patients, individuals who tend to be in their own heads a lot of people. However, the definition of autism changed a couple of times. Um, and so, for example, in the 60s and 70s, um, it was changed yet another time. There was a much bigger emphasis on deficits in social interaction, which were not directly emphasized as such since the beginning um, of this research uh, area. And um, there was not this big emphasis on ignoring a reality. Anymore. So however, what's important for, for this talk is that it's roughly for more than 50 years that in clinical practice and in research, we see a strong emphasis on um, deficits in social interaction that these clinicians trained for years take a strong indicator that a certain individual probably meets the criteria for autism. Because a big question that is also lurking here is that of specificity. We are oftentimes not sure how to exactly come up with the criteria or combinations of criteria to define the diagnosis of autism, where subsets of these criteria do not also qualify for other candidate mental health conditions. So the debate of specificity has been a long and vexing one, and uh, we have not really converged on a particular interpretation of truth or consensus, um, but maybe we should really keep working on it because Autism is a very widespread condition, so more than 1% in our societies probably meet the criteria for autism. And um, that, of course, uh, leads to needs in society that we need to meet who help these individuals. So nevertheless, at this point in time, the clinical judgment, the clinician talking to the patients, is still the best and perhaps the only way to certify this particular diagnostic label. How does this exactly work? Um, so that's maybe clear to some of you, but perhaps not to everybody. And um, we have diagnostic manuals which codify uh, the criteria and the explanations of how uh, diagnosis like autism should be uh, done. And um, those are shared across hospitals, across healthcare institutions. And this is really how medical doctors also communicate with each other, how they have actually um, come to the conclusion through talking to um, their patients, often several times. Um, not just in a single session. So it is very much based on um, lists of criteria that are uh, laid down in these agreed upon incumbent diagnostic manuals, an important one of which is called DSM-5. So let me kind of explain a little, a little bit the broader context as well. So um, over the last decades, we have seen a lot of improvements in what you could call high future biology. And of course, uh, once we had these new technologies, a lot of people thought, okay, let's revisit autism this time with all this information, with this depth, and we should be able to make a difference in autism and identify reliable markers of disease that would allow us to automatically detect autism. So one of those, uh, high throughput technologies that emerged uh, and that became widely available and cheap, less than $50 per subject, is common variant genetics or genome wide association studies. However, these genome wide association studies, they only led to explaining a few percent, around 2% of the observed variants in the autism phenotype. Or if you use this to perform automatic classification, 
we probably cannot very much exceed 70% of classification accuracy of whether or not somebody carries this diagnosis or not. We, from a different perspective, um, we did not find autism specific genes using genome wide association studies so far. So, another high uh, technology that investigators in biomedicine have certainly used is um, brain imaging using magnetic resonance imaging MI. Um, and there's all sorts of flavors of resting state, uh, the so called sorry, of MRI imaging, uh, one modality, resting state imaging is particularly well liked among them. Um, but even teams, very professional machine learning, with years of experience in doing high throughput brain imaging and very carefully conducted data science workflows, they could not get much beyond 65% accuracy in classifying whose brain scan belongs to somebody who is a neurotypical and whose brain scan belongs to somebody who uh, carries a diagnosis of autism. So and this is the reason why still today, even after decades of research in these areas with uh, large data sets from primary biology, we have not really found a way to uh, circumvent clinical judgment as the main means to diagnose these individuals. So um, what's going to be important for um, the motivation of this project is that we take a drastically different approach. <clears throat> Given the lack of progress in biological approaches, especially GWAS and brain imaging, we try to take a different route. And um, we just go back and recognize a human individual talking to the patient is still the best case the optimal scenario to come to reliable diagnosis. So why don't we apply machine learning to the diagnostic process itself? So can't we machine learn using large language models, the clinical decision-making process of how a healthcare professional is exactly reasoning about um, whether the person in front of them should carry the diagnosis of autism or not? to revisit also the question of autism-specific traits. So we don't do this in isolation. As I alluded to at the beginning, uh, our tendency is um, to partner with the main experts in a particular project. So here in this case, we work with uh, Emek Lavo and Laurent from, from the University of Montreal, a seasoned psychiatrists who have been seeing um, hundreds of patients. So the hospital where we draw the data from uh, actually sees uh, more than 100 patients per year. So that's uh, one out of three days, there's a new patient of autism. And uh, so um, it's fair to say that they have certainly seen a huge variety of uh, clinical cases in this area. So they helped us through the process and uh, the particular input data that we use for our LLM project here is um, the actual reports of the clinicians that they uh, put into the system every time they see a particular patient. As I mentioned before, it's not usually possible to come to a definitive conclusion of whether or not somebody carries a diagnosis of autism just based on a single session. So we actually only use the text manifestations of how the clinicians document for themselves and for others what exactly happened when they met uh, a certain potential patient. So we have more than 4,000 of those reports. This is from more than uh, 1,000 patients. Each patient is showing up several times. And uh, typically, the clinicians really need three, four, or six, even six sessions to really be sure and come to a diagnosis um, based on the clinical symptoms that they have observed. So this is what they write down. We digitize, anonymize this. We use OCR 
return um, the, the, the analog information into digitized information. They, we had to do a number of cleaning steps to then finally um, design our large language modeling architecture, um, which builds on a pre-trained LLM. And this is what I alluded to at the beginning, that has already been trained on, on hundreds and thousands of text sources that by themselves do not necessarily have much to do with psychiatry or neuroscience or any other aspects of what we are trying to do. The magic is that uh, we have learned a general semantic representation, a quote unquote, a, a world model, if you will, that we now bring to bear in this clinical data set by fine tuning it on um, the reports that we actually observed. So you will see that we had a specialized attention mechanism on top of it, but I'll get to this uh, at a later stage. What's important to realize here at this point already is that um, we do not um, have a lot, quote unquote, data. We have uh, thousands of reports, which are maybe one or two word pages long each, which by machine learning standards can certainly not be judged to be a massive data set. However, um, this amount of data is actually already enough. Uh, I mentioned that LLMs are quite data efficient, sample efficient. And this is really what we can confirm because fine tuning on this very small set of reports allowed us to outperform a series of um, baseline uh, classification models. So that means we we take the text information that we have in the reports, typically by a back of words representation, so only counting uh, in a sort of histogram, how many times does a certain word occur in each of the text reports, actually using the sequence structure. Um, however, using simple classifiers, we only got to 65% which actually in fact is already as high as uh, what brain imaging has, uh, is able to do. Um, then we tried classifiers with higher order linearity, that's random forests. Also based on the vector forest representation, we get another uh, almost 10% of gain. And last generation of language, uh, uh, natural language process models, to uh, to back, that's a word to back uh, variant. Um, we also did not really get past 75%. However, after finding on this report, we can see that we are almost indistinguishable from 80% accuracy. So that then already means we can build a model. Uh, although it has millions of parameters, we can make it work on a small subset of reports, which is common in the medical community. Uh, we could not train this model from scratch just based on these data. We really need this internet scale pre training step. However, then we can show that we can outperform a series of standard modeling choices. So I'm not going to hide uh, the, the number of steps that we try to take, which did not lead us to make progress in interpretability of why this large language model did perform so well, or how it exactly comes to the conclusion of using elements of the clinician's documented reports to reach accurate classification results, um, of which report in the end belong to an individual who actually does carry the diagnosis of autism or only was suspected to carry this diagnosis. For example, we started off like many, of course, at the word level. In the attention layer, this gives us uh, attention matrices that have the size of uh, vocabulary size on both edges. And as you can imagine, um, this is pretty difficult to work with, to visualize. Nevertheless, we tried it. Um, we tried, for example, decomposing the space with supervised and unsupervised techniques. Um, this did not really lead, in our experience, to sheer progress to making sense of what exactly is coherent in the attention scores at the word level uh, across hundreds and hundreds of reports and in telling the patient groups apart. 
We also tried to perform um, positive only versions of PCA to the attention scores of the hundreds of reports. Same observation. Um, we got a lot of results, but we didn't really get clarity on how exactly. Um, the log language model is uh, for, for taking its decision. And um, we also tried um, graph analysis, network analyses, because we were thinking that the word level representations, they are naturally occurring in semantic webs where um, words are more or less close to each other. And perhaps we can represent this information in a directive acyclic graph and uh, use the arsenal of graph theory tools to come to a more useful representation of uh, what is going on in the internals of the model. This did not really lead to a lot of progress either. Similar but different, we also tried nearest neighbor analysis. So we identified highly attended words that the attention had um, flagged, such as language or behavior, and then we try to find their closest neighbors in the semantic space. Um, you see some examples here, but uh, we made the same experience. We had a, a lot, a lot of data, but uh, not necessarily better conclusions on what is going on in the model. So there's all sorts of explanations that we could now um, make. However, um, I'm just going to, going to summarize it this way. We're saying um, perhaps we are not studying this phenomenon at the right unit of investigation. So maybe we need to change the unit of inference, um, the unit in which we are trying to make sense from these high dimensional results. So and this is where we had the idea. Why don't we go back to the earlier insights in the NLP community, which is working with uh, semantic embedding vectors. So um, every word can be represented as a real value vector, but by aggregating what's words in a certain sentence, in a certain report, we can actually build a sentence level representation. And so we changed our approach and try to go all in on the idea of building a specialized attention mechanism that actually provides more direct interpretability by acting at the single sentence level. And as you will see, uh, that's not the only way in which we can draw advantages. Um, it actually has a whole series of advantages. So just to kind of recap, because this is one of the most commonly asked questions here for this project, we naturally obtain semantic embedding representations. You have 300 dimensional semantic space, you get 300 real values that represent where in the semantic system of the LLM from the pre training and fine tuning, how exactly um, it uh, instantiates the meaning. But we can meet pool across those to get a sentence level representation, which then in turn could be fed into a classifier to tell them apart. This is exactly what we did. So we extended the usual um, pre-trained LM framework that we started with. Um, and we plugged in an interpretability of the module, which is the red one here on the right, a single head attention one, which operates in sentence units. So, uh, which then in turn is fed to the next classifier, which, which achieves the reports. So, the first question would be what this large language model is learning? Is that actually related to um, the classification, or is the large language model just learning quote unquote random things? So, what we see here is the combined uh, NLP layers, the activations from um, this uh, system. Where I submitted to principal component analysis. Uh, so, which means that um, now being at the sentence level, um, each dot in this low rank embedding representation that you can see here corresponds to a particular sentence. 
uh, we performed uh, coloring in this 2D space of the most explanatory dimensions as a function of the known diagnosis. But the diagnosis here in red and blue did not really influence the fitting of the PCA model itself. So what you can see is that in blue, the autism cases, which were later confirmed to actually be a, a genuine case of autism by the healthcare professionals and medical doctors, they actually do cluster in a particular subspace of this plot, which is here at the bottom right. Um, most of it is distinguished by uh, the most explanatory directional variation in the data. <clears throat> so this already shows that um, we can, for a fact, learn an autism-aware semantic space. So whatever it is, what the large language model is doing, it has a close relationship to the outcome that we actually care about. And if you look at the dots, there's some overlap, but it's not doesn't seem to be too much overlap. So how can we try to dissect this even a little bit further? One way, the classic way, is uh, so-called surrogate models. They do not try to recapitulate the exact mechanics of the model fitting uh, that happens in the actual model. We consider here that this may just be too complicated. Instead, we use a simpler, more interpretive model, in this case, just a linear model, to mimic the predictions that the actual model, the large language model is doing. So even if the large language model is wrong in certain uh, unseen reports, we will fit the linear model to actually mimic this behavior. So what we see is that um, we can fit layer-wise prediction models for each of 12 different layers of um, the overall large language model. And we see even in the earliest layer that we get around 75 0.75 uh, area in the curve performance. And um, so uh, already at the earliest stages of this model, we uh, can discriminate the patients at a fairly high rate. Um, and it gets better and better with every layer, with a 12th layer reaching performance up to 0 0.96 area in the, area in the curve. So um, having a deeper model, this is an important conclusion here, for effect actually does lead to better prediction performance. Um, so uh, we want to have a nested multi-layer LLM um, to really uh, extract as much information as we can. And what's coming out of this 12th layer is then actually the input for uh, as you saw for uh, our specialized attention. So here's an example of the attention scores, what it looks like in one particular uh, report, because uh, as you know, um, you get a different attention score matrix for every input observation. So uh, this is why you see here example reports um, in each of these three plots. Notice that we do not have words on the axis anymore. This is what uh, this usually looks like because this is the result of our uh, specialized attention module where we now can see how does the large language model actually assign relevance not to single sentences even, but to combinations of sentences. How does the large language model actually more or less look at the reports in this particular case, all the sentences that make up one particular report to come to the conclusion whether or not this report belongs to somebody with autism or just was affected with autism, but it was ruled out. So uh, I would just quickly mention that we do indeed see all sorts of words and notions and concepts in the sentences that are flagged here in the cubes that have high relevance to what is discussed in the clinical field um, in the these clinicians as relevant aspects in coming to a conclusion about this diagnosis. So we use these highly attended sentences 
to go further and map out some of the most relevant words. So let me just emphasize again, those are not word level analyses. Um, the trick uh, from our project is that we re-represent everything as a sentence notion. However, once we know the most intended sentence for each of the reports, we can actually go and uh, carry out descriptive statistics on the ratios uh, for a certain word of most attended highlighted words between who ended up to carry the diagnosis and who didn't. And you see that here at the top of the list, words, letters, flapping, that's the motor movement, and fingers. There are the three top discriminators um, that occurred up to 20 and more times more often in the most attended sentences in the reports of the uh, autism patients compared to the suspected autism cases. So uh, there's all sorts of ways in which we can now um, look into the machinery, what's going on. Um, but um, the common question for scientists is probably, how do you validate those results further? How can we know that you, what you find there is actually real and not just artifacts of a carefully conducted data set exercise? So this is where um, Jack and me came up with the idea uh, of performing an external validation in the following way. So um, the machine learning community tends to try to really solve um, model interpretability in my opinion, in a somewhat isolation of everything else that exists. Um, what we thought is that maybe in this particular application domain, there is a way to integrate already existing knowledge that is not part of our input-output mapping function of a fine-tuned LLM, but that can actually provide us insight into what it is what the model is learning. So I mentioned before, the DSM-5 diagnostic manuals, that's the catalog. This is the enshrined description system that clinicians are using every day on plan to really diagnose these people. So wouldn't it be great if we can relate the DSM items, which were not actually uh, measured by themselves in any of these um, patients, how can we actually bring this in contact with what is going on in the internals in our LLM. So, but briefly, what's important for the interpretation is that we have two big clusters uh, in the DSM system for the diagnosis of autism. And the most important, important um, take home message is that the A section has this classical strong focus on social impairments. Um, which has a big, big emphasis on how we study, diagnose, and treat autism until today. Whereas this B section uh, also contributes to the diagnosis, but has a much weaker emphasis. So first off, we tried to quantify in this semantic vector embedding operations sort of way, um, verbal descriptions of each of the established DSM criteria that I just mentioned, how do they actually relate to our um, autism aware semantic space? What we see is uh, we can actually map them into the sentences again, one dot being one sentence uh, in our reports. We can we, we find that it's actually the B criteria. So the section that's not social behavior related, it's those that are in the subspace in blue, which is actually leading to the diagnosis spot. So um, it is not the case that what is currently most emphasized, the social impairment indicators, which is um, A1, 2, and 3, those ones are actually at the opposite end of the push of the component one. Um, the way we quantify the relationship of DSM-5 criteria and uh, semantic embeddings was uh, cosine similarity. 
So of course, force and similarity has been used before in NLP to quantify the similarity of semantic representations. But the point is here that we could not necessarily have done this at the word level, the way in which these elements are typically used in medical space, in neuroscience, and in theology. So yet another way to look at this is um, that we can actually now take each of the seven DSM criteria, we um, revisit the semantic embeddings of the leading sentences, the most discriminatory, the most attention uh, receiving sentences in each of the reports. And we can now quantify how similar is it in meaning to uh, the known seven DSM criteria. And let me just say again, the trick is really that the DSM criteria have never been measured in these patients or in these clinical settings. However, we found a way to introduce them into our modeling pipeline so that we can perform an acid test against established knowledge. So um, the value of one is very similar in semantic meaning, zero is there's no relationship, minus one is the opposite meaning. So we did this for the, um, the most attended sentences in both cases, the autism and non-autism groups. And as you can see, uh, again, we have the criterion B1, B3, B4, the non-social criteria, which are actually most similar to the autism diagnosis, we do not find it, uh, that um, our leading sentences that are most useful for autism diagnosis, that those are actually very semantically similar to the, the healthy group. We confirmed these results uh, using latent discriminant analysis. So we actually re-represented each report just as the seven similarities of the leading sentence with established seven Ds and criteria. So we only had seven numbers instead of the whole semantics of um, the report that we initially had. And we could reach uh, pretty high prediction accuracies and answer reports of around um, 0.98 area under the curve. So this shows that um, our large language model actually looking at from, from different perspectives and with all sorts of ways to try to peek into what our refined hardware large language model is doing, not at the word level, but at the sentence level, not at the neuron level. But I would claim that we found a number of interesting ways uh, to sneak peek into it. And the core conclusion is that we cannot confirm this 50 year old idea that there is a very strong emphasis on social deficits and what is the most important in coming to an accurate autism diagnosis uh, based on the data that we analyze. So uh, instead, it really turns out that it is stereotype, repetitive behaviors, special interest, and um, sensory behaviors that appear to be much more discriminatory, at least in how the large language model attends to the semantic units that we find in text reports from clinicians on the actual settings where they come to these conclusions. And um, that could mean that maybe we have to readjust some of these gold standard manuals, such as uh, the DSM-5. There's all sorts of ways in which we could take this to the next level. Um, one way would be to, uh, I alluded to it, deconvolve now the um, NLP uh, activations of our finding element even further. Uh, we saw from the PCA space that there is certainly structure that uh, is closely related to the diagnosis. However, we could use uh, further decomposition techniques uh, especially uh, sparse over complete dictionary learning to try to see are there really perhaps thousands and thousands of concepts or features that um, are actually instantiated in the NLP parts of all LLMs that contribute to the successful diagnosis. We could also uh, perform all sorts of follow-up analyses from the attention at 
um, ablation studies, if we have multi pad uh, systems, we can perform all sorts of uh, modifications of uh, pre output layer activations and so on and so forth, um, what sometimes described as counterfactual analysis. And both of these ways that I just mentioned, um, so finding privilege basis one and uh, forms of population studies two, um, we could also look at this from the context of uh, optimization. So as a function of training epochs, looking for um, jumps or non-smooth transitions from one training iteration to the next one. So the interpretability takeaways is, it's not just about prediction accuracy uh, uh, for biomedicine and neuroscience. We are one of these areas where it is extremely important to come to a conclusion also about how exactly did the system come to its prediction. Uh, from a larger perspective, this is of course extremely relevant for the AI safety debates. So any progress in the LLM explainability realm that probably translates to benefits in the AI safety uh, problems as well. And I hope I can you that um, sometimes it helps to simply re-express the problem, rotate the problem into a different space, um, recast what we're actually trying to find um, to make uh, specialized versions of our architectures and that actually have all sorts of downstream benefits. And I hope I can you that we did use external information to really validate what we have found and um, the internals of our LLMs did align with established diagnostic criteria and we could automatize these comparisons at scale without human intervention, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, is one of the weaknesses of this whole LLM sustainability field at this point. So finally, some product placement. If you're interested uh, in these kinds of reflections, um, feel free to check out our recent paper. With this, I thank you so much for your attention, and I thank the organizers for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. I can't say thank you to Danilo, but I will say uh, thank you to Jack. Uh, there, there are some questions already in the in the in the discussion. Yeah, I use this one. Yeah, I use it. Uh, but I'll ask one because I have a feeling that you you hear this one a lot, or you will hear this one a lot. If you were not studying autism, but um, brain imaging. Clearly, you wouldn't say, I want to hear what clinicians say about these images. You want to use the images as the data. Is there any possibility of that in the, in, in the autism study? Well, by the way, it's the same if you were here in the morning. It's the same thing as what Friedemann said about the cross validation with, uh, I mean, with real brain data. Yeah, well, I think, is this microphone working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think. Are you sort of getting at the aspect of you know using multimodal information using all yes it's it's grounding text. I, yeah I'm so I think asking about grounding yeah yeah for sure I think that would be uh, we actually had a few questions about this before of using things like brain imaging and also um, sort of uh, other biomarkers in conjunction with the text information to get more robust uh, sort of predictions and, and interpretations and I think. Yeah, I think that'd be really useful. It's just we don't we don't quite have the data set uh, to do that at this point. But I think if you know if we want to collect that kind of data set, I think it would be super helpful in this context. Okay, uh, here's here's some of the questions that came in. Everybody here is welcome to ask questions. Everybody out in the two other lands, the attendees and the panelists as well. So should I read the question? Yeah. Okay. So the first one here is: Could sentence level representation be performed on verbal production of the child? rather than the interpretation of the clinician. And could this help further focus on that, uh, which are stereotypical utterances or lack of neurotypical utterances? Yeah, so this is also another question that we, we get frequently is, um, so we're training on the clinician observations directly, um, whereas you know maybe we could actually train on the, um, on the actual speech patterns of the, the child or the individual. Same um, question I asked you. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think I think that would be again. We don't have the data for that um, at this point, but I think that would be you know super helpful to maybe even integrate those two things. 
Um, and I think that would probably give us even better um, ability and, and uh, performance for sure. Uh, but, yeah, maybe I should go to the, to the room next or. If they, yes, go ahead. No, why could you come up here? Oh, oh, no, here so she can get her face on. I, I was thinking about the uh, like sorry. they were talking about like uh using the child's uh, uh like uh, speech patterns to diagnose audience I was just thinking about like eye movement and eye uh like uh, eye contact that would be like you could track it you know, like you could have a what do I say a computer vision model to like uh, you could have like frames of the video that we can analyze with the model computer vision model to accurately track the eye movement. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's that's another suggestion that we got for sure is is incorporating eye tracking because I think that from what I understand, I'm not you know totally familiar with it, but from what, what I understand, there's a decent amount of data available on eye tracking in autism. Uh, so it would be very interesting to, to incorporate that as well. So maybe just going back to the like, question here. So the same uh, comments are asked. But if a single no, sentence- not necessarily the same one, but it's un unidentified oh. and it's- Okay, okay. Well, they asked that a single sentence slide seems to mirror content analysis based on ADOS and the ADR assessment variables. Could we not train on data analysis directly from those these scoring tools? Yes, yeah. again, that would be, um, that's something that we're looking at as well because we do have the data for that. Um, but it's just trying to incorporate it uh, into what into our pipeline. Um, we didn't we couldn't make it work exactly, but uh, and also there's a lot of missing data in, in that in that uh, um, analysis. But we definitely like to to uh, to do that uh, as well. Another one, sure. So I think one of these ones. So the next question here is: Are there any models working on the diagnosis of ASD with adults who have acquired some uh, compensation skills with regards to social skills? Although nonverbal assessments of Section A, the ADOS module four questions tend to flush these out. Um, yeah, so this is a good question. Um, so we worked, the demographic that we were working with mostly was uh, children. So I think there's a median age of around five. Um, so this is really, the data that we have is, is coming from children, but again, there's sort of another um, aspect of diagnosing adults with autism, um, which you know carries with it a different sort of set of, of questions and things that clinicians look for. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, we don't have the data set for that, but um, it'd be very interesting to look at that as well, for sure. Um, I guess I'll go into another question online here. Read it really slowly and enunciate. Okay. They, don't, they can't see it. Okay. I am mirroring Stephen's question when asking if we could not use ADOS slash the ADR directly. Uh, so the gay studies are becoming relevant. Yeah, and again, that's that's something that we would definitely like to work with if we if we have have the data uh, paired with the clinician observations as well. Uh, so this is really interestingly, this is one of the first data sets that we've come across. This is a you know proprietary data set that we've collected uh, in Montreal. Um, so there just isn't a lot of uh, now. The thing is, of course, there's tons of health records available that we could mine potentially if we get access to that. Um, but this is sort of a, a you know a preliminary uh, investigation into using these these uh, clinical observations. So this last question online here is: Does the model's accuracy vary as per the functioning of the patient? So how does the model fare with high functioning individuals? So that's a really good question. We actually didn't uh, look at that. Um, it's sort of hard to assess you know which individuals are high functioning and which ones. Um, so, so the data that we got, we didn't exactly have, um, you know, a direct variable for that, but I guess, you know, we could go back and, and look at the reports, um, and sort of potentially put them on a scale of, you know, high functioning to, to low functioning instead of just giving a binary prediction. So that could be an interesting avenue to explore. Um, but yeah, that would be interesting to know if the model itself, uh, finds it fair. I would, I would imagine that, yes, that is something that's hard to, um, it's hard for the model to disentangle if the individual is, you know, very high functioning in many areas. There are less signals in the text that actually point to autism, whereas sort of the lower functioning ones, it's much more concrete. You know, they have, you know, troubles with speech. They have you know, very obvious um, repetitive uh, movements or or tics. 
Um, so that's much easier to pick up, obviously. We're in academia, and half of the room is Asperger's. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, so so I will say these. So these individuals um, that we uh, that we studied were uh, much would be more on the, um, uh, I guess, lesser functioning side, just because they were referred to a specialty autism clinic, just to get, you know, a, a more formal diagnosis. So obviously, if there was you know, a lot of doubt, then we probably would not have them in it. We take care of our own. We don't send them to clinics. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Other yeah. questions? From here, from there. If not, if not, I have a last question. Sure. For you. Sure. you could you could speak of uh, of uh, LLM research as hearsay research because words are words and, and all you're getting is hearsay. They said, said this and people said that and they said the same word with that word. So if we call that hearsay research, you're actually working on another hearsay body. And the question is, isn't it time to also, for example, when you're looking for other medical records instead of autism, where maybe there's not, there, there are not many direct measures for autism, but if you went into cardiology, you'd surely have a lot more data to use than just what the clinicians say about their data. No, you're definitely right. I think this the idea of grounding is very important in the medical domain for sure. Um, and again, we just wanted to, to tackle um, something where LLMs are immediately applicable, which is autism, because there's, there's simply nothing else we can use really um, other than the clinician judgment and the clinician observations that are- Oh, hearsay. Exactly. So, so we wanted to actually directly look at that hearsay and say, you know, what are the aspects of this here say that lead them to new diagnose? No, it's a terrific study. Yeah. In fact, it's time for us to applaud you for the both the study and for your. Thanks, Uncle.